Hello and welcome to another instance of my vlog. For those of you who are new here, I'm an indie app developer and I live in Oslo, Norway. And this is a proper winter vlog. Everything is pretty much frozen, but we still get some pretty clear days and I wanted to take you along on a typical day working on a bunch of new features. In my previous vlog, I started working on this one particular feature requested by a user and I just didn't quite finish it. I already did implement the part where you can monitor your system system usage right from the menu bar, but I didn't put the finishing touch, which is to allow my users to change the icon of my application as well, because that was actually the original feature request. So we're going to be doing some coding today, but also I received a new keyboard in my mail. And so there's going to be a really satisfying unboxing segment a little bit later. In the meantime, I just want to say that every year the floating saunas culture here in Oslo is getting stronger and stronger. And because it's such a beautiful day, lots of people are out there walking and just enjoying but I have a suspicion that it's going to get a little bit crowded later when I try to find a spot where I can finally sit down and code but I just wanted to show you real quick on the other side of this bay the sea is actually completely frozen and coincidentally I also found this ball just sitting there in the ice I'm not sure if somebody tried to see if the ice would break or if the ball had fallen accidentally but it was just very fun to see and you can see it's frozen all the way every year I'm kind of amused by this, even though I've been living here for a number of years already. Anyhow, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the behind the scenes of the mechanics of filming these vlogs, especially when I'm there, maybe in a coffee shop and trying to film my work. I kind of have this funny heuristic where you don't really know what you're going to find. For example, I'm walking up these stairs and I have no idea right now whether or not I'm going to find an empty spot to even sit. So the heuristic is you always film as if everything is going to be perfect. And then if it doesn't turn out to be the way you imagined, you go to plan B. But somehow magically today, I was able to find this spot right there, right next to the stairs, which was extremely convenient. All right, so I mentioned in my previous vlog, I already implemented these widgets in the menu bar that can show you the current usage of your system resources like CPU, memory, and network traffic. And in order to implement the customization of the app icon itself, I started reworking a little bit of the code for the menu bar itself. And I must say that integrating Swift UI within menu bars is still kind of hacky. And I mentioned that in my previous vlog, but I'm still surprised by the way that Apple has almost kind of given up to fully integrate it, even though they are fully aware that many, many apps take full advantage of menu bar customizations. But anyhow, it's just something I have to deal with as I'm working on this ongoing theme of UI customization within my app. However, today, before I even manage to change the icon, I really have to figure out something related to iCloud Sync. And here I have my main class that does all of the synchronization called JSON value observable. And what I really need to do is generalize it a little bit so that it can store images and other things, not just JSON. And so as I'm doing this, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. So I've been pretty vocal about the fact both on these vlogs, but also in my discord that I'm not really using AI for coding anymore at all. And I get a lot of different comments about it, but a few people in the discord suggested that I should try Claude code because it's somehow better than the alternatives. And so I try that specifically with this one task of creating this generalized iCloud synchronization class. And so I want to tell you a little bit of an anecdote and my experience with that because it is a little bit hilarious. So long story short, so far I've been using this framework called Swift Data and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it for synchronizing data over iCloud. However, it has this one very weird quirk in that while you can synchronize the data itself, you never really know the status of the synchronization process. In other words, you never really know if the data has managed to synchronize fully. And that can create a lot of different edge cases that are kind of difficult to deal with. And so I opened up Claude code and I asked it, how can I know if the synchronization has completed? Because I simply want to synchronize the user settings occasionally between different computers. And I want to know if the data that I have is actually fresh data coming from the server. And oh my God, Claude went on a field trip, invented a thousand different hacks. For example, storing some magic constants in the database to somehow be able to tell that this constant is only for my machine. Then it went even as far as suggesting to find the actual database file on disk 
by opening a shell and then inspecting the file itself to figure out some metadata. But in reality, after reading a little bit of documentation myself, I realized that Apple actually provides a lower level framework called CloudKit that doesn't do any kind of fancy caching and it simply request response style programming. And I'm looking at this entirety of my Claude code chat where it implemented like almost a thousand lines of like really hacky code to make it work. And I'm thinking, why couldn't you have just told me that I can use CloudKit directly? How can this be useful? I mean, it must be pretty crazy to think about all the different code reviews that Claude is doing right now on GitHub Actions that are suggesting all kinds of crazy hacks. Is this really going to be the production code of tomorrow that we're gonna have to be dealing with as users? But anyhow, I just wanted to tell you this story because it is kind of wild what's happening out there. Anyhow, it took me a little bit, but I finished the sync and I managed to build this simple UI for customizing the icon, but I realized I didn't have any other icon to use. So I just opened up Figma and I drew this little boat icon. And when I tried it, it actually worked out the first try. I mean, you don't have to believe me, but it did and it made me really happy. You know, sometimes it happens. And now all I gotta do is like wrap it up, clean up the code a little bit and also try with the custom icon that my user suggested. But while I'm doing that, I just wanted to spend a few moments to unbox the keyboard and show it to you guys. Now, full disclaimer, this part of the video is sponsored by Lowfree, but I already have the first version of the keyboard that they sent me, which I bought with my own money and I reviewed it on this channel and was pretty happy. So they reached out to me and they said, well, why don't you try the second version? I mean, we're gonna send it to you. So I was like, all right, send it over. And so here we have the Lowfree Flow 2. And simply talking about the specs, it's a gasket mount, full aluminum body with low profile linear switches. It's a triple mode keyboard, with which kind of explains the receiver in the box. And I will let you enjoy the sound and also the sound comparison between both of these keyboards at the end of the unboxing. But first, I just wanna make a few comments about the build itself. And I'm going to compare it to the keyboard that I already have. And the first word that came to my mind when I opened the box is brutally precise. Not in a bad way, but everything is so tight and precise from the keys to the shape of the keyboard itself, to the really tight corners and edges. It's not rough, but it's like brutally precise, like almost architectural. I can't describe it in any other way. And as a consequence, it has way less wiggle in the keycaps. I noticed that first thing when I started playing around with the keys, it's very, very tight. The tolerances are much improved. And now speaking about other improvements, I will mention that I really appreciate the uniform keycap design and the fact that they do provide different modifier keycaps for different platforms instead of trying to cram everything on the same label. It has much, much better backlight than what I used to have because let's face it, the first version, even though it's a great keyboard, the backlight was kind of lacking. I will say that right off the bat. And in terms of ergonomics, it does come with these adjustable feet. So you can plop them out and you can adjust the angle for typing, which maybe some of you are going to judge me for, but I don't use them all the time. Now, one thing that I didn't notice when I was unboxing this is that the keyboard actually has this touch bar on the side. And I discovered it accidentally when I was working on something else a few days later, actually, and I had to record it right there. And basically it allows you to slide your finger across the touchpad and it will adjust either the volume or brightness of your display, which is really cool. And it works really well. It's smooth and responsive. Overall, the keyboard is much cleaner and I would say it's an improvement in pretty much every respect comparing to my old keyboard. For the sound test itself, some of you know that I already developed a game, a typing game, where you can try and type out snippets of code from famous repositories. And I always use that when I test keyboards. So here's me just trying to type out some code. And at this point, I'm just going to shut up and let you enjoy the typing test. And then at the very end, there will be one or two clips comparing the sound of the new keyboard to the old keyboard. All right, I don't claim to be a very fast 
typist, but this is my result. I encourage you guys to try the game. I'll put a link in the description. It's totally free and uh, I just made it for the community. And I'm curious how fast you guys type. But anyhow, going back to my app, there was only one thing left to do which is to actually recreate the icon that I got from my user, Marcus. And I'm very grateful for the email, but I didn't find the SVG version of the icon in the email, so I had to recreate it quickly in Figma myself. And, you know, it works really well. I'm really happy with this implementation. And most likely by the time this video is out, all of these new features will be released. And I'm really excited to see what you guys think about them. In the meantime, if Marcus feels up to it, he can post the original file on Discord so we can all enjoy his icon and we can all go crazy with customizations. Now, at this point, I was pretty much ready to wrap it up. I had to go and prepare myself mentally to go out there in the cold. And every time I go out there, my fingers are completely frozen when I try to film a few more clips, but I think this time was worth it. The sunset was just something different. I don't see it every day here, but today I must say I was a little bit lucky. Once again, thank you guys so much for your support. I hope you enjoyed the vlogs. If you enjoyed this one, consider subscribing. It really helps me out here on YouTube and I will see you in the next one. Oh, and by the way, check out the keyboard. The link is in the description as well. So thanks Lofree for sponsoring the video.